Hey, it looks like it's time for me to do another video on Mormonism. I recently came across a very interesting open comment by Lindsay Hansen Park, who is a post-Mormon. She is usually in charge of organizing the annual Sunstone. I believe it's the one down in Utah. I know Sunstone meets in other states in the United States. And uh, she has done extensive discussion work on Mormon polygamy and the real cultural, legal, moral problems slash issues with Mormon polygamy. And she is a post-Mormon, what we call a post-Mormon, someone who can't adhere to the current doctrinal, cultural norms within Mormonism because it's so biased against the LGBTQ or minorities or for whatever reasons. Uh, she posted a letter on Reddit. I do believe it was from Reddit. I'm going to read you that letter. It's not going to take very long, but uh, she had a run-in with the Mormon missionaries and so this is her experience. Let me read this. Let me go ahead and get this up here and read this. Lindsay Hansen Park expresses her frustration with bridge building. Now, the idea, and I think this is more uh, post-Mormon, not active current Mormon, but people who have left the church, but it's still the culture. I think this idea of bridge building is more in line with the post-Mormon mentality than with the Mormon mentality. The Mormon mentality seems to be convert and believe alike we do or we won't accept you. So she expresses her frustration with bridge building. And she uses a, a visit from the missionaries to her home as a recent example of some of the problems. And this is a few months back. I want to talk about bridge building with people you disagree with, using a recent experience with LDS missionaries who came to my house. As many know, I'm a member of record. That is, she's been baptized, temple marriage, and all that jazz. But I don't attend for reasons too various to name here. Still, Mormonism is my heritage, culture, and identity. Mormonism has always been an important part of who I am, which is why when the missionaries come over, I always let them in. I've gone through several iterations of companionships in the last few years. We usually let the missionaries come in, give them root beer and cookies, and we talk about music or video games. And I know how hard missions can be for these kids. I often say Exmo Reddit is a boneyard for missionary trauma. I've spent over a decade in faith crisis spaces, and missionary trauma is a huge part of people's stories. Missions are demanding and rigorous by design. Now, I didn't attend an LDS mission. I got temple married instead. But it was part of the culture that pressured young men of my generation to go and shamed them when they didn't. I can vouch for that. Uh, that was definitely the norm in the ward I was raised in. So this is why when the missionaries come over, we're kind to them. Uh, I try to let them just be kids for a hot sack. I've talked to lovely groups of elders and sisters over the years. Lots of good experiences. The following recent experience was not one of those. I want to acknowledge that I know these kids are barely grown. And there is immense pressure, expectation, and reward attached to missions. They might have chose this, but only in the way anyone chooses the inexorable. When the new companionships showed up at our doorsteps, we invited them in. We had a brief chat, and they asked if they could talk to my 17-year-old son. My son was blessed, but never baptized. And so for this reason, he's still on the records of the church, and the missionaries apparently have access to those records, so they paid her a visit to see if they could talk to her son. 
I've never had missionaries ask to speak to him before. I thought this might be a good chance for him to practice boundaries around these conversations. But I was unprepared for what happened next. My son agreed to talk to him, so I imagined it would be courteous and a mutual discussion like we'd had in the past. They had asked him, the stalwart atheist, if he was interested. He'd say no, and then we'd drink root beer. But that's not what happened. We got a blitz instead. Next thing I know, we're in the midst of the first discussion. It happened fast. I've heard missionary pitches many times before, but this was my first time sitting on the other side trying to understand this from my son's perspective. It was not a good experience. I'm sad to say that it took me having to experience this with my mama bear eyes for me to understand just how inappropriate LDS missionaries can be. I've always tried to hold space for the impossible position we put our youth in. But this was a conversation that wasn't one. It was a manipulative script that didn't allow my son to say no. It was guided questions that looked like agency, but really just incentivized compliance. It was bad manners. It was condescending. It was rude. There was no mutual curiosity, and it was clear that our opinions not only weren't wanted, but we weren't going to be able to offer them. Questions weren't really those, and saying no wasn't always offered without being combative. So they got him to commit to several things, including a second discussion, interestingly enough. So when they left, I was sort of shocked. And I said to my son, are you really curious about this? Are you interested in becoming a practicing Mormon? He said, no, mom, ha <laughs> ha, never. I was just being nice to him. He told me it seemed that they really wanted this and he wanted to show them respect by taking their ideas as seriously as they did. He was being polite. Well, for my part, I was kind of stunned. The discussion had been so rote. It was so pushy and, frankly, offensive. Did I push back enough on harmful things? Was I too rude? I don't want to be labeled as an angry apostate. It triggered a lot inside me that's been dormant. At one point, they told us that the Book of Mormon was a story about two groups, the Nephites and the Lamanites, and that all we need to know is that the Lamanites are the bad guys. Boy, that's way different than when I was on my mission. Now it's me talking. That was way different than when I was on my mission. Wow. And so I said to my son, Lamanites are brown people. And the elder smiling said, yes. Inherent racism still because of the Book of Mormon. That's my comment. I know Mormons today love to say, no, they're not racist and neither are the scriptures. Well, there you have it. There were other really egregious things said that made me embarrassed for them and furious that they're still being propagated. But still, as our culture raised us during the first discussion, my pushback was polite and too gentle. My son was compliant. For the second discussion, we were more prepared. My son was polite and firm in telling them that he did not that he did try to pray and ask those questions, but he didn't have their promised result. They tried to ask him to try again, and again he declined. I let him say his no's, and when it was clear they weren't going to accept them, I stepped in. Mama Bear broke the polite rules, and I told them we weren't interested. They were always welcome to come have conversations, but I expected future ones to be equitable. I ended that I had no intention of ever returning to activity because the church's stance on LGBT issues was unacceptable. So out of empathy for their mothers that sent them out this way, I won't tell you how the rest of that conversation went, but these boys need manners. I've been reflecting on it all week. My brand has always been, there's more than one way to Mormon. I've tried to argue for pluralism in a community that really works hard against it. I believe in bridge building. It's essential for all of us. 
That's Lindsay Hanson Park's idea. But, and here's the key, bridge building has to be mutual. That's the reason, that's the lesson I was reminded of. We hear a lot of talk about both sides these days. Well, I'm a believer in bringing people together, but it has to be relational. There has to be mutual curiosity. So talking with both sides is essential. It's also hard work. I know this because I grew up with extremely binary thinking. I'm seeing the damage that it does. I will always try to approach my community with the same patience I was offered when I said and thought ignorant things. So there are so many good Mormon people that believe bad doctrine because they weren't given choices otherwise. So I will always try to stand as a person to offer the choice otherwise, since I'm grateful that that is what was afforded to me. But the fact that in 2023, representatives of the LDS Church are going door to door and spouting unblushing white supremacy and LGBT division, that's unacceptable. So apostate politics hurt families in my community. And it would be easy to demonize these young men. I am trying to hold space where I can. It's sad, though, that these young men were taught not only ignorant things, but that teaching them is brave and good. So this is a community problem. It's not their problem alone. Sometimes I just get embarrassed about where I came from. This is one of those times. And then her last tweet was, I'm annoyed that I get accused of being too hard on Mormons when I have to endure this stuff because of where I situate. We showed grace that wasn't reciprocated. I hope LDS can update the cultural incentives and ask what is owed to those who believe differently. And so this is quite interesting because I'm not sure the church will ever teach that. In fact, I'm convinced the church will never teach that because it comes from the position of we are correct. Not only that, regardless of how much they protest, regardless of how much they whitewash and fib about it, if not directly outright just deceive everyone, they really do believe and they absolutely teach everyone within the Mormon church that they are the only true church. No other church is true. Oh, it, they may have bits and pieces of truth, but being true is reserved only for the Mormon church. And, uh, you know, they, they're trying to assimilate better, not being so peculiar as a people nowadays with the Christians because of various social issues that they find they need more help than just themselves on uh, being mere prophets and apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not enough, apparently. The, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost teaching people the truth is obviously not enough for them either. They have to begin siding with Christians who have political power within the United States government. And so that's what they've been doing. Well, in order to do that, of course, they have to tone down their rhetoric, but they're teaching their community on the inside all of the stuff that still makes them condescending and rude to absolutely everyone else. You, if you are not Mormon, are never going to be given the chance to be exalted through the temple ordinances unless you become one of them. That's all you need to know to know who they believe is the true church and all the rest of the world isn't. So this issue is a cultural issue. It can easily blow up and bloom into a huge political uh, downside, if it, if you will. Uh, it doesn't have to, but of course it's going to. I mean, in some, I, I can empathize entirely with with uh, Lindsay. I really can. 
On the other hand, sincerely, why are you surprised? Right. I, I, I mean, come on. This is Mormons you're talking about. Uh, they will never fit in with the rest of the world because they don't believe in the world. They want to be in the world, but not of it. That means they're never going to welcome you unless you give up who you really are and become one of them, think like them, dress like them, comb your hair like them, shave like them, and smell like them, and talk like them, and pray like them, and worship like them. Then you'll be accepted. Otherwise, you're just a conversion project of theirs. See, there, there can be no real friendship because they don't teach that. They don't want to be your friend. They want you to become like them. Their ultimate goal is conformity, not friendship. Their ultimate goal is intellectual conformity, not being who you actually are. Their goal is spiritual oneness. And if your spirituality steps outside of the little box that they want you to stay remaining within, then you are accused of being in league with the devil or you're, you're threatened. The Holy Ghost is going to leave you and then you're going to apostatize and you'll lose your eternal blessings, etc. And they have, they still have their special insider lingo that they use on absolutely everybody. Covenant, priesthood, covenant path, etc. You see. So once we understand the extreme bias of the culture, once you get the idea, the actual reality that they're, they're not interested in you as a person, they're interested in you as a convert. That's why you can't build bridges with them. Sometimes we have to be forced to just face the brutal, uncomfortable fact. Mormonism does not want to be your friend. It wants you to submit to it. And now you know the rest of the story. That's why the missionaries act that way. And I, and I entirely agree with Lindsay Hansen Park. It is a community issue, but there is no issue with their side in their own minds because we are the true covenant people. We are the reason Jesus Christ is going to come again and save the world because of us. We are the ones who's going to save the Constitution when it hangs by a thread. We are the ones who are going to help the Jews believe in Jesus Christ again. We are the reason why. I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The world exists for the Mormons. And if you're not part of them, then you're definitely on the outside. So they don't have any reason or need to build bridges. That's a one-way street from post-Mormons and ex-Mormons. And noble though it is, just realize it's really close to a waste of time to do so because it won't happen. I guarantee you the church leadership is never going to bring you in to the councils of the church with the church and try to work through this with post-Mormons and ex-Mormons who are disgruntled with the social issues and the ridiculous stances and attitudes of the bias inherent within Mormonism and its scriptures. I promise you, they're not going to give one inch. It's you or out. You are the one that have to change, not them. They're already representatives of Jesus Christ. Why change that? See, that's their approach. So that's just my quick thoughts on what I consider to be a very interesting experience with the missionaries that she has had. 
uh, it's too bad that her atheist son was just being nice and complying. If you're atheist, man, I would I would throw them some real good questions and fully expect them to give me the answers without question. And I wouldn't let them get away with, well, let's bear our testimony about the Book of Mormon. Yeah, no. No, here's my issues. And then let them try to deal with them. But, you know, I mean, put them through the ringer. Put them over the fire. Of course, and on the other hand, what you'll do is you will, of course, make them interpret that. They are taught to interpret any kind of a disagreement as a persecution against them. So you can't win. <laughs> I mean, if you're looking to win, meaning if you're looking to build bridges of mutual respect and understanding, I can't help but think you're living in a wilder fantasy than if you began looking for the real Middle Earth of J.R.R. Tolkien, imagining it was actual. I think that would be an easier quest for you. But that's just my approach. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say on this very interesting, uh, thought-provoking and kind letter from Lindsay Hanson Park, one of the truly great postmos, uh, who has done some magnificent work in trying to get people at least understanding better some of the issues involved with polygamy and some of the really difficult uh, doctrinal razor blades that are found within Mormonism and the minds that blow up in their faces all the time because of their doctrine of being the only true church. We can expect more and more and more gaffes and ridiculous situations, especially now that we know how utterly sinfully filthy, rich, and greedy they are. You can expect to see more and more of this. So. But to see them actually change and do it different, uh, that would take a miracle bigger than Moses parting the Red Sea if that really happens. So, Anyway, thanks for watching the Backyard Professor video on other issues on Mormonism. I'll bring out more as I discover them and as I find the interesting ones that I don't mind discussing. And I will catch up to you guys soon. Have a great night.